breaking news. Apple launched several important new products that will mean a lot to photographers. A brand new iPhone and a new Mac desktop oriented computer that is more powerful than any of our MacBook Pros. I'll tell you all about it, whether you should buy it and whether it will actually change the way you work. But first I want to thank our sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace displays your work on the web in the most beautiful way possible. Squarespace has amazing designers that provide a wide variety of completely customizable options for you. You start with their designs and then add your own personal flavor to it to make a custom website that represents who you really are, far more precisely than social media could possibly do. It's also incredibly functional. You can set up a store. You can take appointments from clients. You have detailed analytics so you know where people are coming from and what parts of your site they're visiting. Get started today at squarespace.com Tony, and when you love it, use the coupon code Tony and get 10% off. Thanks, Squarespace. First, I'm going to tell you about the iPhone SE, and then I'm going to get to that new Mac computer. This is a $430 iPhone. Yeah, you don't have to spend $1,200 on an iPhone. It has a 4.7 inch screen, 5G wireless for good performance if you happen to be in a 5G area, an A15 Bionic chip, and maybe my favorite feature, it actually has a home button at the bottom with a fingerprint scanner. I really miss that since I upgraded to my big iPhone 13 Pro Max, especially today when I'm so frequently wearing a mask and the face recognition does not work well with that. Let's talk about the camera. It is a single lens camera, but still the wide angle 24 millimeter is very capable thanks to the, like, the massive amount of computational photography that they build into it. It has the Smart HDR4 uh, feature first introduced with the iPhone 13. This like HDR and traditional photography, captures pictures at multiple different exposures and then intelligently combines them. That's something cameras, traditional cameras, cannot do. For example, the iPhone SE can detect up to four different faces in a picture and then vary the exposure of each based on the person's skin tone. If you've ever had to photograph people with wildly different skin tones in a single photo, it can be very difficult. The light-skinned people might be overexposed, or the darker-skinned people can just get lost in shadow and their skin will end up all noisy. This is something a $6,000 Canon or Sony camera has not figured out yet that the iPhone does really, really well, and it means I don't have to do a whole lot of post-processing. It means I don't necessarily have to like bracket and combine different exposures just to get great skin tones on everybody. It also has Deep Fusion, which was first introduced in the iPhone 11. What Deep Fusion does is combines nine separate images to create one really high quality image with great exposure and a ton of detail. Before you push the shutter, it has captured four very short images. And then when you push the shutter, it will capture one longer image and then four images after that. It's what you see when you scrub through on a live view photo but it actually takes the best parts of each of the image and it does so in my real world experience extremely intelligently. Quick anecdote, I was at the park with my daughter and one of her friends and we were taking some portraits but the sun had set and we were in the woods so it was actually very dark. I had a very nice Nikon camera with me and I set the shutter speed to 1 60th of a second. A little slow but it was so dark I didn't want the pictures to get too noisy. Well guess what? None of my Nikon pictures turned out and all of my iPhone pictures turned out. Turns out they were just moving around too much, just wiggling from excitement that 1 60th of a second was too slow, but I could not tell that from reviewing the back of the screen. Yes, it was human error, but the iPhone overcame that human error by actually taking multiple pictures, analyzing the movement of the subject, and picking frames that did not have the movement in. So it is literally foolproof. Even as a professional photographer who studied it for 25 years, I still make mistakes, we all do. And if my equipment can help reduce the number of human mistakes that get introduced into my work, I'm really excited because like nobody's perfect, right? Of course it has portrait mode, but it does it with a single wide angle lens. So you're not gonna get that sort of telephoto headshot look that we associate with professional portraits. But nowadays most portraits are more wide angle anyway, really thanks to the influence of smartphones. But it will create that depth of field. It's not just for people's faces, but really anytime you want to blur the background for the sake of subject separation. It's a compositional technique that fo focuses your attention 
on the foreground subject. It does it by analyzing the single image and separating the foreground and the background. We're currently testing the iPhone 13 Pro against the Google Pixel 6 Pro and the Samsung S22 Ultra. Now these are $1,100, $1,200 cameras. Spoiler alert, the iPhone 1 for the bokeh. The iPhones do the best job of separating the foreground and the background. They smoothly blend in the fake background blur with the foreground subject in such a way that I can rarely tell the difference. If you watched early reviews of the Foca techniques in smartphones, you probably found that we didn't like it. But now, I actually like it. And in my own personal life, I use it a lot. So I'm really glad to see it coming to a $430 smartphone. Apple's launching this on March 11th and it should ship on March 18th. If you're interested in smartphone photography, developing better skills, I suggest you check out our book, Stunning Digital Photography. Now you're saying, oh, I don't like to read books. I like to watch videos. That's why I'm on YouTube. It has 20 hours of videos built in. So you can read the book, watch the videos that go along with it, or just pick one or the other, whatever fits your mood at the time. We teach not just how to use traditional interchangeable lens cameras, mirrorless cameras, DSLRs, but also drones and smartphones because it is a modern book that has been continuously updated by yours truly for the last decade. The best-selling photography book in the world for the last decade. Anyway, check it out. 22% off using the coupon S22. We made that for our review video that's coming up soon. Now let's talk about the Mac Studio, a tiny little desktop computer that's meant to be attractive on your desk. I'm most excited about as a person who uses all high-end computer gear is the introduction of the M1 Ultra chip. This is the M1 Max chip that's in my MacBook Pro, but basically doubled. The CPU cores go from 10 in my M1 Max to 20. The GPU cores go from 32 to 64. The maximum RAM goes from 64 to 128 gigs. The RAM bandwidth goes from 400 gigabytes per second to 800 gigabytes per second. Now you might think this means it's going to have twice the performance, that you'll be able to render your videos or import your pictures in half the time. This is not generally the case. Performance doesn't necessarily scale perfectly because not every bit of code can be split across more and more cores. Subscribe to this channel for us to actually test it and tell you just how much faster it is. I actually think probably the most useful of these specs is the improved RAM bandwidth. That's not something a lot of people think about, but if you're doing photo and video editing, the computer's moving a lot of stuff around in RAM and the faster it can do that, the faster you can get back to doing what you wanna do. Like the modern MacBook Pros, it offers up to eight terabytes of SSD. That's something I find really invaluable, especially as we're recording most of our videos in 4K60. And I have that new Sony A1, which shoots 30 frames per second. I'm moving a lot of data. I have more data to store and even an eight terabyte drive isn't enough but it lets me wait a little bit longer before I move everything off to my network attached storage. Let's talk about the ports that it offers because it's a ton of them. It is four Thunderbolt 4 ports. And if you aren't familiar with these, you can use these for a lot of the newer monitors have Thunderbolt inputs. You can also use them like USB-C ports so they're backwards compatible. It also has a 10 gigabit ethernet port. Most gigabit ethernet nowadays is one gigabit. I'm really excited for this because Chelsea and I have the latest MacBook Pros and we have 10 gigabit ethernet adapters attached to them, but they use one of the precious Thunderbolt ports and it does make a huge difference. We often are able to get five or six gigabits per second to and from our NAS and we're moving these big huge video files and tons of tons of photo files around all the time. It also for backwards compatibility has two USB-A ports. Those are just the old rectangular style USB ports. Right now I have to use a separate dongle to attach external accessories like the mic that I use for voiceovers at my desk. So having that built in is really nice. It also has an HDMI port for another monitor or for a big TV or something as well as what they call a pro audio jack, which is basically a headphone jack, but you could hook it up to speakers or a subwoofer or something else. The front of it is useful. It has two USB-C ports so you can quickly attach accessories there, and also an SD card reader. For Wi-Fi, it has Wi-Fi 6, which offers the quickest performance, but only in very close range. If you wanna get the most out of that, you really have to have a router like right next to the computer, but it can offer better performance. The Mac Studio can support up to four of the 6K Pro Display XDR monitors, which is 
what Chelsea uses. It can also use that HDMI port to connect to a 4K TV. So your display options are pretty much unlimited. The Mac Studio configured with the lower end M1 Max chip, that's the top end chip in modern MacBook Pros, it starts at only $2,000. So it's probably going to run you significantly less than a MacBook Pro would. If you get it with the high-end M1 Ultra chip, which is like two of those M1 Max chips combined, you're gonna be spending starting at $4,000 or going all the way up to $8,000 as I configured it in my dreams. It should ship March 18th. And if you are considering configuring this, I'll give you a couple of pieces of advice. You never have enough disk space, okay? You will fill it up however much you get. So put more of your budget into that SSD storage. I have 64 gigs of RAM in my MacBook Pro, and I very rarely use more than 32 gigs. However, I have run up against that limit and even caused problems when trying to do large stacking projects in Photoshop. If you don't know what that means, then you probably don't do that and you probably don't need any more than 32 gigs. But for me personally, I would probably opt for 128 gigs and just completely max it out. If you ever find yourself frustrated with how long it takes your computer to render video or import and process previews for photos, then you should spring for the higher end chip. If you, don't, if you do not have those problems, the M1 Max chip is incredibly fast, and that's what we're using today, and we're very happy with it. Looking at the new Mac Studio versus the MacBook Pro, like if you're configuring them out to get the most capabilities possible, maybe you're a professional at this like us, the Mac Studio offers an extra Thunderbolt port and up to twice the RAM. Like I said, most people won't need that RAM. It also has the 10 gigabit Ethernet port built in to USB A's, so you don't need dongles or docking stations for everything. And they both have a headphone jack out. Of course, the MacBook Pro has a proper screen and a battery and it's portable so you can take it on the go and that is something I really like. I've been pondering getting the Mac Studio just to get twice the potential performance and keep it on my desk and then use my MacBook Pro when I travel, but that requires me to synchronize files and I'm not sure that the additional performance is actually going to be worth the overhead. I think I'm gonna wait to buy the Mac Pro, not the Mac Book Pro, but the Mac Pro is the professional desktop computer that just packs in as much processing power as possible. That's not what this is. This is Apple's compact, stylish thing for creators like myself who don't necessarily need the ultimate in processing power. Finally, Apple introduced the Studio Display, which is a 27 inch, $1,600 5K monitor. So it's got a few extra pixels over a traditional 4K monitor. I find that useful in Final Cut Pro that would allow me to review my footage in proper 4K while still having a few controls and things on the bottom. The pixels are very dense at 218 pixels per inch. So unless you really got close to your monitor, you probably would never be able to distinguish between the individual pixels, essentially infinitely sharp for the purposes of the human eye. The brightness is quite bright at 600 nits. By comparison, the newer iPhones have about a thousand nit screen, so it's not quite as bright, but you're probably not going to be using it in full sunlight. Nonetheless, as long as you're using it indoors, it should always be plenty bright for the room that you're in. It also offers Apple True Tone technology, which is built into MacBook Pros, and I find the screens on there represent images really, really well. Thankfully, these screens have a camera built in. I guess Apple noticed that a lot of us are video conferencing nowadays, has a 12 megapixel front-facing camera with three mics to collect better sound from you. That's really nice because right now I either have to open up my MacBook Pro and use the camera built into the screen or attach an external webcam. They also have good sound built in with six speaker surround sound with spatial audio. In the comments down below, tell me whether you're going to buy any of this and how you're specking out your new Mac Studio. I'd like to thank our sponsor Squarespace for making this possible. Right now, head to squarespace.com slash Tony and just set up a site completely free and see how it makes your work look. Squarespace represents you in a beautiful and completely customizable way with almost unlimited capabilities. You can set up a store, you can take appointments, you can view detailed analytics. Squarespace makes it all possible. Once again, visit squarespace.com slash Tony if you love it. After your free trial, use the coupon code TONY and you'll get 10% off. Thanks for watching and thank you Squarespace.